morning, uh, afternoon, and evening colleagues. My name is William Shemali. I'm with the Global Protection Cluster. And I would like to welcome you to our discussion this afternoon on approaches to isolation, quarantine, and prevention measure, uh, including uh, shielding, or what's referred to as shielding of vulnerable individuals in a humanitarian setting. Uh, I'm very glad. Uh, that we have uh, uh, many of you from all over the world, despite uh, uh, being a Friday, uh, knowing that it's uh, Ramadan for, for many of us. And uh, I uh, thank you for, for your attendance today. Today we have with us uh, experts uh, from the World Health Organization and UNHCR and UNICEF uh, to facilitate a conversation on how we deal with uh, such approaches. Uh, what are we doing now in the field? What do we know about what's right and wrong? And uh, create a space for in exchange with, uh, with the operations on the ground to hear from you what you're doing and uh, in which areas we need to, to uh, engage more and uh, create guidance and tools uh, to uh, take your projects forward. I'm very glad uh, that we have with us today first Teresa Zakaria from the health, uh, World Health Organization. Teresa is uh, a health emergency officer and has been heavily engaging and engaged in, uh, in the process of developing uh, guidance uh, on the measures that need to be taken uh, during COVID-19. Uh, that includes a uh, protection dimension uh, to them. We have also with us uh, Daniela Raimond, uh, the global coordinator of uh, CCCM, who has also been following with. Can I, sorry, can I ask everyone who's not speaking to mute because there is an echo? Uh, Sorry, we still have a couple of colleagues who are not here. Thank you again. So we have as well with us Daniela Raiman, uh, the global coordinator of the CM cluster, who has been also following up with several operations uh, dealing with the measures uh, that I mentioned before. Brett Moore, the global uh, shelter cluster coordinator, has joined us, and Masumi Yamashina uh, from UNICEF, from the Child Protection AOR, a child protection expert who will also engage with us. The way we'll structure the conversation this afternoon is we'll start by short uh, presentations, uh, starting with uh, Teresa, then Brett, then Daniela and Masumi, uh, and open the floor for uh, interventions from field operations. What we would like to hear from the operations is two things. Uh, one is what are the practices that you are doing uh, and the kind of uh, good examples that you have managed to, to accomplish so far, as well as uh, key challenges you are facing uh, that would require further discussion uh, or clearer answers uh, to share from uh, the global experts as well from other operations who are on the line with us. So without further ado, I would like to kick off the conversation uh, with a presentation by Teresa. So Teresa, please uh, start the conversation for us by first helping us to clarify what are the differences between these approaches and what's the right narrative we have to carry uh, about them. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, so thank you uh, to the three clusters uh, for this opportunity to have this interaction with you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that this is a topic that is uh, very much alive in many parts of the world and in different settings. Um, and so it's great to have this opportunity to have a discussion on uh, what we mean when we talk about isolation, quarantine, as well as uh, the preventive measures that um, we aim for, uh, particularly vulnerable individuals, those who have uh, risk factors for complications and poor outcomes of the disease. Uh, 
Um, so um, for uh, the admin colleague who is helping with the presentation, can you please move to the next slide? Okay, so this is just in a glance so until the 30th of April. Yesterday, over 3 million cases have been reported, and this is from 212 countries or states and or territories. And over 200,000 of deaths have been reported from these cases. I think this is just a, a, a couple of figures that everybody is aware of, uh, but uh, good to bring these back into perspective. Um, now, importantly, what we have learned so far uh, as interventions that are actually successful in slowing down transmission, it's really to, uh, the basic principle is really to find all those who are sick with COVID-19 and then isolate them from the healthy population. Uh, and this is the uh, best way to slow down transmission. And so to, in order to be able to do this, then we need to have sufficient capacity to actually test those who seem to have COVID-19, so the suspect cases, and then to isolate and treat all of them, including those with mild diseases, because they too can be infectious to others. And then because um, normally each case would have close contacts, um, um, potentially exposed to the virus, it is equally important as well to then uh, list, trace, uh, and uh, monitor all of these contacts and uh, quarantine them for a period of 14 uh, days, which is the incubation period of uh, the disease. Um, and so uh, the aim is really to stop cases from just a couple of them, sporadic, from becoming clusters and from clusters to evolving into wider and out of control community outbreak. But then, so what do we mean when we talk about isolation? So what's very important is that isolation is for sick people. We isolate people who are sick to keep the rest of the uh, healthy population safe. Quarantine is not for sick people. So quarantine is for those individuals who are not sick, but who may have been exposed to the virus. Uh, and as soon as they become sick, they would then need to be isolated. So that's a, a, quite a significant difference. So quarantine, we normally hear the term quarantine used, especially for travelers at airports or, or, or even goods. I think... Uh, I'm hearing background news. Okay. Um, okay, so let me continue. So quarantine, uh, we normally hear quarantine when we talk about plants or animals being exported or imported from one country or another or travelers being quarantined. But quarantine is a public health intervention aimed at those who we think may have been exposed to a pathogen, to a disease, but who is not sick yet. So it goes way beyond what is being done at uh, points of international points of entries. Um, so uh, it is true that to be able to test all suspect cases, to be able to treat all of the cases, even those with mild diseases, and to do contact uh, tracing properly, a lot of resources are needed. And um, humanitarian settings are particularly challenging to be able uh, to where these measures can all be implemented. So there are indeed adaptations that need to be done, but we also need to uh, very much rely on the basic public health principles behind these interventions that uh, we need to, to follow if we really want to bring uh, this outbreak uh, into containment and even to stop it. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is just uh, very uh, briefly. Um, uh, the adaptation process itself for the public health and social measures that are recommended to control uh, the outbreak uh, need to be very much based on the characteristics, on the context, uh, and, and every setting is different. Even within the humanitarian affected countries and areas, there's a lot of difference uh, between one setting to the next one. So we need to be mindful of these characteristics in order to adapt our measures. Uh, and these include over the, the conditions of shelter, uh, how crowded um, the setting is, uh, whether it's in a camp or other types of setting, whether clean water and sanitation are available, uh, how do people uh, live day to day, uh, what type of livelihood activities are they engaged in, uh, 
uh, whether there's what's the status of food security in the setting, whether there's a lot of malnutrition uh, prevalent in the areas. And these uh, humanitarian, when uh, I speak here about humanitarian settings, obviously we also include the humanitarian camps, but also the illegal settlements and maybe even some of the urban slums where uh, we see a lot of displaced people also coming to find refuge. Uh, and then the characteristic of health systems in these areas are normally quite weak, be it on delivery of essential services, on financial protection, on uh, these capacities to respond to COVID, and also the, res the capacity of the health system to respond to everything else, because obviously there is the outbreak of COVID-19, but there are also a lot of uh, prevalent morbidities, a lot of important diseases for which essential health services need to be sustained at all prices. Next slide, please. So then, important assumptions uh, that we need to take into consideration when we want to adapt these measures for isolation, for quarantine, and other prevention for vulnerable groups are, do we actually know what are the biomedical factors, the risk factors for complication and poor outcomes in these type of settings? The data that we have up until now shows that age, older age, especially those above the age of 60, the presence of hypertension, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, are important contributors to uh, risk factors to the development or in, and the progression of the disease. But then uh, these are very different settings. Uh, we have received most of our information from China and from uh, high resource settings. Now, specifically for humanitarian settings, collectively, we're still lacking information on what additional risk factors can determine the progression of COVID-19. For example, malnutrition or tuberculosis or malaria, uh, are there correlations between these diseases that we see much more frequently in humanitarian settings with the ultimate outcome of COVID-19? This we don't have sufficient information yet. And we hope, so this is something as well that WHO and, and, and partners are all aiming to monitor closely. So we need to have a better understanding on the manifestation of these disease in humanitarian settings and in low resource settings in general. We need to know whether the same risk factors are as pertinent or there are other diseases, other conditions that we need to be aware about. Another important assumption is that due to the overcrowding and perhaps inadequate shelter and lack of access to safe water, we believe that in humanitarian setting, once the virus is actually introduced inside the setting, it is very likely that it will spread rapidly and potentially the entire setting would be exposed even though not everyone would become sick. Um, and then the last two, um, uh, the next assumption is on uh, the difficulty that we anticipate already on uh, being able to implement the prevention and control measures that are so popular in high resource setting, the confinement, the lockdowns, uh, what are the basic principles to this and how these would impact negatively or positively in humanitarian settings and therefore what adaptations are needed. But on the other hand, we also know that even in uh, camps, humanitarian camps, there's a lot of strong community ties and structures with influencers and, and trusted chains of communications, meaning that if measures can actually be agreed bottom up, then the likelihood of it actually being implemented is uh, higher. The success rate may, uh, may become higher if everybody is actually engaged. Uh, next slide, please. So at the moment, um, uh, many organizations are working together to develop um, uh, an interagency standing committee guidance for the adaptation of these um, public health and social measures for COVID-19 uh, for low capacity and humanitarian settings. So what we try to do collectively is to identify and list all the important public health and social measures that are applicable and important everywhere and then how these could then be adapted to low capacity and humanitarian settings and what key actions we need to, to sustain or to implement even in the poorest resource setting. Now, what we have learned together collectively in the development of these, of these messages on the key actions is that most of the time the public health principles cannot be compromised. We still need to actually 
put in efforts, for example, for hand washing, there's nothing really that could replace hand washing. But because there are humanitarian and development actors in the many parts of the world, then it is also then our collective duty to push, to continue pushing to make sure that safe water is available, to make sure that hand washing supplies are available, and to make sure, therefore, that people can access and, and, and use hand washing facilities. Uh, next slide, please. So you, we hope to be able to um, publish this interim guidance next week. Um, and so as soon as it is published in the uh, uh, IASCA website, I'm sure then all the cluster coordinators would be circulating it uh, widely to all partners. So then coming back to the issue of isolation. As I've mentioned earlier, this is a critical measure to make sure that we can contain the outbreak. It is important to separate those who have COVID-19 from the rest of the population. Now, how isolation is done, ideally in health facilities. But as we know, even in the richest country, it has been very difficult to find enough hospital beds to accommodate everybody who has the disease, especially if we want to extend the care and uh, the, uh, uh, in hospitalization to those with mild diseases. And therefore, um, uh, the, the usage of community structures, including uh, the setup of new temporary tents for the purpose of isolation is extremely important. So uh, the key message from this slide I would like to highlight is really the hierarchy of isolation. If health facilities are not available, in most cases, I understand that it would be the, the, the situation locally, then we still need to make efforts to make sure that there are some designated community facilities. Now, these community facilities would then need to be equipped with staff who are trained, of course, and with supplies and also with the support required for those who will be isolated during their isolation time. And there needs to be also uh, sufficient space for cohorting individuals according to severity. Um, so we cannot be mixing those with severe cases with moderate cases and those with moderate cases with mild cases. Understanding that testing capacities may be limited as well in these areas, we have all agreed that once you know that the virus is circulating um, in the setting or in the country, then syndromic surveillance, so the, so the uh, characterization or the, taking the decision to treat somebody as a COVID-19 case can be made just based on signs and symptoms, even without lab capacity. So this is an important step as well uh, to make sure that we are not late in detecting cases, that we're more conservative. Um, uh, in, in trying to detect cases. If, and in most situations, health facilities will not have sufficient capacities, then the next step would then be to identify and uh, operate these designated community structures. It can be buildings, it can be community uh, houses, it can be, we, we want to avoid schools as much as possible, but then other um, community uh, town halls, for example, uh, other structures that could be used. Um, uh, for isolation purposes, uh, these may then be mobilized for the purpose or new structures could also be erected for the purpose. And then as a last resort, um, one can isolate especially the mildest cases at home, but this can only be done once an assessment has been done in the household to make sure that some IPC, basic IPCs can be put in place, including, for example, by adding a physical barrier uh, paravent, um, like a, 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 a handmade separation, even if it's just from a carton board, uh, but any type of physical barriers that could then be uh, placed uh, to make sure that uh, the sick person can be isolated from the rest of the household. I mean, there are various ways uh, that could be identified to make sure that these three types, these uh, hierarchy of isolation and treatment can actually be done. But then there's no one recipe for all, of course, and, and the best solution really needs to come from um, a, from a collective uh, discussion and decision making with uh, the people we work with, with the people we serve. Uh, next one, please. So that was for isolation and meaning it's for cases. Now, uh, the quarantine of contacts. So because quarantine is meant for individuals who are not sick, but who may have been exposed to the virus, then it's intended for contacts. And contacts are individuals who have been in touch with sick, so with COVID-19 cases. They may be COVID-19 cases because they were tested positive. They may also be COVID-19 cases because they have all the signs and symptoms and, and it has been decided that these individuals would be treated as COVID-19 cases. So contacts 
in this case is applicable for contacts of probable cases who, were, who we could not test as well of confirmed cases. Uh, the incubation period of COVID-19 is at the maximum 14 days and that is why quarantine should also be implemented for a period of 14 days starting from the time or the day of the last contacts. Uh, now I have lost my slide there. Uh, on the screen, but um, I think I should be able to continue. Okay, so ideally we also want in, in settings where there are abundant resources, we also would like to see contacts quarantined separately because they may have been exposed to the virus. And so it is likely that during the period of 14 days, some of them may become sick and may become COVID-19 cases. And so to be extra cautious, we would like them to be quarantined in separate facility. But understanding as well that in most situations, even in, uh, in rich countries, it would already be difficult to find sufficient community structures to treat the cases. Therefore, there is a little bit more flexibility on where a contact could be quarantined. And also understanding that in many situations, contacts would still need to go to work because they may be the only breadwinner of the household, then for as long as they're not sick and for as long as daily monitoring could be assured, this is still allowed. So while a case isolated should not go anywhere, contacts under quarantine can still um, a, a perform their essential duties for as long as a strict monitoring system is in place. So now the last part, which is the, uh, the prevention measures for at-risk individuals. Um, it is extremely logical that we want to protect those whom we know might develop complications from the disease. As far as we know at the moment, their age, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, but in low capacity and humanitarian settings, it is extremely probable that there are other risk factors that we are yet to find out that may result in complications. And therefore, it is safest if we protect everybody in the same way. Prevention measures should be made available for everyone to begin with. <clears throat> now, um, in certain locations, there may already be collective accommodations um, uh, operating um, for, like, for example, retirement homes. These may already exist and these facilities may already have residents. In these situations, if family members could uh, reaccommodate their uh, loved ones, that is an option. Otherwise, then it is extremely important that collective accommodations are monitored closely and that their measures for infection prevention and control are actually very, very strictly implemented. We have seen in uh, Europe and in North America how uh, the disease has actually managed to uh, infiltrate retirement homes and kill many in the thousands without people really realizing or realizing very late. And these are facilities in high resource settings where we know people are trained, the caretakers are trained, there are doctors and nurses for each facility and people take precautions. So in resource uh, poor settings and humanitarian settings, we may not be able to ensure that these control measures are in place and therefore to actually place people whom we know would be at risk of developing complications and poor outcomes is extremely dangerous because if the virus is actually introduced into this collective facility, then the likelihood of it actually spreading even faster and killing even more is extremely high. So our recommendation is if we would like to shield, meaning prevent or strengthen the prevention measures for individuals whom we want absolutely to make sure that they don't catch the disease, it needs to be done at the household level with the support of the family and not in a collective site somewhere else. Um, the risk is because uh, first, as I mentioned, if the virus is introduced into a collective facility, the consequences will be very dire. Secondly, if we then uh, allocate resources to actually build these shielding facilities, we take away resources from the measures we know work, uh, isolation and quarantine. So if we can uh, allocate resources to set up shielding facilities, we should be able also to set up isolation facilities. Uh, and also for how long would these at-risk individuals that need to be shielded is a big issue. How long can we sustain uh, running a, a green zone or a shielding facilities? 
So our recommendations remains the same is that we need to focus on detecting and isolating cases, quarantining contacts and monitoring them, and then any strengthening of prevention measure should be done at the household level. And this is uh, my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, uh, this uh, was very good to. And if, if I can, can ask you to mute. This was very good, good to set the right definitions and put, put the whole issue of quarantine and shielding in perspective. perspective. Uh, let, let me now, now turn, turn to you, you Brent. Uh, of, of course, course shielding or quarantine in any other measure. Um, has, has to happen in the physical, physical space. space. Often, uh, starting, starting in a some kind of shelter. So, what's the experience, experience from the shelter, shelter cluster? And what, what are the best, best advices you can you know, give us? For, uh, Th thanks very much, William, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, Teresa, for the presentation. It was really rich with content, um, so thanks very much. Um, certainly on behalf of the shelter cluster and the shelter implementing agencies, um, it's been, of course, a challenging time to understand exactly what can be done. So um, as mentioned by Teresa, uh, initially a lot of the guidance that came out was for high resource settings and for many of us um, listening here today um, it you know it may be somewhat easier for us to kind of follow the general guidance of stay at home and wash your hands but for many of us and clearly for those um, living in displaced contexts specifically camps and camp like settings it's very hard um, next slide please so at the Global Shelter Cluster, what we did, we've got a dedicated page. I'm sure many of you have visited it already. We've got a lot of cluster colleagues online. Um, now we've prioritized the key resources online. Certainly that coming from WHO, that coming from the IASC, and also that coming from the field clusters. Now this is an important point that we have to try to find the, the right balance between the high level guidance and then something that can be applied at the detail level because shelter practitioners, um, they have to calculate numbers and requirements um, and any kind of building provision as part of the response to this health issue. So in the end, a lot of the shelter colleagues, they really need the details. So we have to strike the right balance between the general principles and then enough information so that details can be provided um, that are right to any context. Now we've distilled what we see um, as the key um, multi-sector messages down to these five key elements. The first thing is really the material assistance. Now when there's existing NFI programs, um, what we do is try to maximize that. And of course, that's uh, applicable largely through local procurement. We're also very aware that international supply chain, uh, supply chains have been uh, threatened or broken down. A lot of airports are closed. So lengthy international procurement processes that we would often rely upon when it's a large response clearly can't happen. And of course, this is not just a humanitarian issue. This is a whole of society issue. So we've had to try and place these kinds of messages within any other larger national context. Um, now, the second element there you can see is that adequate shelter is really crit critical for protection outcomes and for health outcomes more generally. And that doesn't even really matter if it's a humanitarian context or not. There's clear evidence um, from all kinds of sources for really decades now that people that are living in poor conditions uh, suffer poor health outcomes. So there's a large and strong determinant um, on the public health uh, and shelter relationship. So shelter has a very, very big uh, impact on how people live. Um, so what we're trying to do is really give clear guidance for two particular perspectives. One is on living within the shelter, so density at shelter level, 
and one is at the settlement level. So what we're trying to do is provide a um, clear pathway where people can plan interventions at the household level and at the settlement level. Um, so at the household level, um, the key issues are really around understanding density. What is too dense? How many people in one shelter or how many people in a settlement is um, considered too much and tends to exacerbate the risk of COVID-19 transmission? Now, this is hard. We don't have clear indicators about this because it largely depends upon people's behaviour. As many of you would know, the um, guidance which we have universally applied for quite some time now is, is the sphere standards and many agencies of course have their own accompanying standards but really uh, 3.5 square meters of space per person is how we've planned a lot of shelter interventions for many many years now does that metric actually have an impact on COVID-19 spread or not well, the answer is we don't know um, if you've got a 17.5 square metre house, that is minimum adequacy for a family of five, um, what difference does it make if you have an 18 square metre house or a 20 square metre house or 25? We really don't know. But the general rule of thumb is that people that are living in higher density conditions will, of course, have a higher risk of spreading COVID-19. So what we need to do is mit mitigate density concerns at the household level and the settlement level. And then the third element there you can see in the infographic is really around provision of adequate space and infrastructure for the health requirements. So it's reframing our shelter approaches to meet health outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've got, um, we've got a, a series of guidance online and we're just uh, in the process of developing something a little bit more specific to guide practitioners at field level. Now, of course, as I mentioned, um, trying to understand what are the density conditions in the household and what are the density conditions in a settlement actually require some assessment. So, of course, the cluster and agency have, have many different kinds of assessment formats but what we've tried to do is distill down the key elements um, that help for a rapid assessment at the settlement level and the household level. So I've just taken a screenshot there of a part of, a part of the guidance, um, and we hope with consultation with partners um, in, and with our co-lead um, IFRC to develop something that's quite universally applicable. We know that many field cluster coordinators have already developed guidance that's appropriate locally uh, in conjunction with local health authorities um, in close collaboration with protection, WASH, CCCM and community. Because of course, whenever we're developing guidance for a specific displacement context, it doesn't make any sense if the host community around um, don't have the same kind of regime applied because where we have quite fluid contexts, you can't have two kinds of social order prevailing without consistency. So you'll see there the settlement um, uh, density guidance really is looking at the current population of a camp, the total population of a camp. And if the current population is greater than the total capacity, uh, we've got some density issues. Of course, in consultation with health colleagues, we can, who can identify um, the numbers of people of concern, and that is largely defined, as Theresa mentioned, by age and comorbidities, but of course, other locally applied selection criteria. So then we know the proportion of the population that we need to provide additional assistance for at the settlement level. Now, of course, like any settlement, there might be pockets that are more dense than others. So density reduction might occur in only one part of the settlement, depending on the, what the result of this uh, rapid assessment process is. In the section down below at the household level, we really go back to the basic principles of how many members in a household. And of course, we prioritise for those households which have the highest density first. 
Uh, certainly need to uh, look at simple local solutions, provision of local materials, uh, cash for shelter approaches. So as I mentioned, avoiding um, time consuming and lengthy international processes because we need some quick wins. So once the assessment's complete, we wanna prioritize something that's feasible um, at a local scale without relying on something that might require two or three months to implement. Next slide, please. So just a simple graphic of what that might look like for the household level assessment. Um, you can see something on the left, which shows a very simple outline of what a shelter might be. Of course, the first option is to extend existing. Um, now that is when you might have some simple materials available. Now the second option is for when you might need to um, construct a separate dwelling. Now that is only appropriate if the plot of land you have available allows that. If you're on a very small plot of land, a second dwelling may not be possible. But of course, the first one is for um, an internal separation, and that provides an additional amount of space aligned with the recommendations that Teresa outlined. And secondly, when you have to have a household or a household level isolation and you've got room for a second dwelling, the third option there is what might be mostly applicable. So the main thing is just to make sure that you concentrate on what's a quick win locally through a locally procurable process. Um, you'll also see online that we have um, selection of health infrastructure uh, in, responsible for, uh, in response to COVID-19. So that's using our most standard NFI kit and seeing what's easily available. Now we've also linked through to the CDC um, infection control um, guidelines for how to quickly clean and disinfect so you can make sure that you're keeping the space healthy. Um, next slide, please. Now, when the data comes through, when you look at the settlement level, so after you go through the rapid assessment, you can see that there's several planning options available um, within an existing settlement. Sometimes if you have additional land and you go through a series of questions to see whether additional land is available, you can um, construct additional dwellings there if the density calculation of the overall settlement was found to be too high. This kind of analysis also allows us to uh, allocate land for the health facilities. So health facilities, as Teresa outlined, may likely require um, additional capacity which will require an extension. In many cases, it is shelter officers and others that are involved on the ground in these kinds of construction activities. Uh, for example, in UNHCR, we've used refugee housing units, we've used larger tents, um, MSF tents and so forth. So there's a variety of prefabricated op um, options that may be available already on site. Otherwise, there's construction of ad, uh, additional ward space. And as Teresa mentioned, we need to pay careful attention for those that are um, 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 only mildly affected versus those that are uh, more severely affected and separate the categorization of each of the caseloads. So we can see here the different kinds of information available and in seeing how you can identify land. What is the calculation method for understanding how much land to select and how should you plan that land out, uh, the spacing between units and certainly the extension requirements for the health facility to make sure you're providing spaces that are adequate for isolation or adequate for the health facility. Now, of course, we don't want to promote isolation or any kind of shielding. It's not a recommended approach if you can not do it safely and if you cannot do it without having a leaky effect, as they say. So if it cannot be done with adequate um, separation, you may be pe um, putting people at, at greater risk. So, be, so follow the health guidance and understand the protection risks before deciding to go on any additional site development process. And then I'll just go on to the last slide, please. Now, of course, when we're planning out a facility, we need to, um, as I mentioned, separate confirmed from suspected cases. And 
with any kind of principles for infection control, they have an architectural manifestation. So what I mean by that is that we normally try to separate patients, visitors, and staff. There's three kind of pathways for human movement within a health facility. So this is just a schematic diagram that's been um, developed from the um, SARI guidelines, that is severe acute respiratory infection facility guidelines, but bringing it down to a very, very simple level. So our next step really is to finalise the guidance with partners to field test it with um, our cluster colleagues and um, technical staff on the ground and see if it's broadly applicable for the range of contexts that we find ourselves in. Um, so that's really it from my side. Um, these are some kind of reasonably um, achievable measures. I know that we have a lot of guidance out there. The guidance that we have so far is more working at the conceptual level and what are the principles we're trying to work out. So the purpose of this guidance was to take it down to the next level and have it um, applicable in a technical sense so that field colleagues can move forward with interventions, um, certainly well in advance of risk arising, we would hope. So thanks everyone, that's it from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Brett, for the visual and clear and concise uh, presentation. Uh, for the colleagues who are asking how to get hold of the PowerPoints, uh, we will share them with the uh, recording of the webinar just after the webinar. But also, Teresa and Brett, if you have any links uh, to guidance you have referred to, you want to drop in the chat box, uh, please feel free to do so. We'll also put them uh, when we upload the recording of the webinar. Uh, I have already several questions uh, in the chat box. Please, colleagues, continue putting uh, in questions. We'll take them uh, after uh, the third presentation uh, coming up from Daniela CCM. I would also encourage colleagues who would like to speak uh, and present what you're doing in your operations uh, to kind of mark that in the chat box. So I encourage the cluster coordinators uh, in the operations to do so, uh, and then I will take uh, give you the uh, the possibility uh, as we're going. For now, let's uh, move uh, beyond the, the immediate physical dimension that Brett uh, presented uh, to the specific case of uh, camps and settlements uh, with Daniela, who has been working uh, with uh, other colleagues uh, on these issues in several operations. So, Daniela, where do we stand in our practices in this and what can we tell the colleagues in operations? Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone and apologies if you have uh, some background noise. Um, that's what teleworking means. Apologies for that. So when it comes to the camp management and CCCM cluster, there has been a lot happening um, and if I could ask you for 30 seconds. Sorry, I need to go and deal with my family situation. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Daniela. I really appreciate uh, this situation. We're all in, uh, in similar uh, contexts. Uh, maybe uh, just while waiting for Daniela, I want to direct one uh, specific question uh, to you, Teresa, uh, that came uh, from uh, Yona Stanley. Uh, Teresa, uh, Yona asks uh, that the validity of testing for cases versus screening uh, before determining who should isolate, how, how does that work uh, actually? Is that really valid? And even assuming that adequate isolation is possible in camps and camp-like setting, is that uh, uh, the right assumption? Uh, maybe what uh, what do you have to uh, to say to that? And then uh, we uh, we proceed with Daniela. Over to you, Teresa. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the question. Um, so um, uh, the only way we can actually the only methods of confirming um, a, the presence of the virus in the body is through the molecular test, so PCR. Uh, serology test does not do that. Uh, PCR test is also important to guide the clinical management. 
um, you would uh, some a body would only develop antibodies detected through serology tests later in the disease. Uh, the virus, the 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 amount of virus actually that are excreted uh, through our upper respiratory tract is highest when we become when we first become sick. So during those very early days of becoming symptomatic, and the only way to to detect the virus is through the PCR test. And so when when you mentioned screening, um, from the surveillance perspective, when we say screening, we want to do a symptomatic screening. So screening would involve a, a, sign, a, a detection of signs and symptoms uh, that are suggestive of COVID-19. So a temperature measurement and then um, uh, an evaluation of whether there is a history of fever or dry cough or sore throat and uh, any other uh, symptoms that we would list in our case definition. Uh, so screening, uh, the more you have little capacity to test, meaning to do PCR test of suspect case, the more you need to um, strengthen your screening capacities because you would like really to detect all those individuals who are symptomatic, who have the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Now, um, we, we can have a separate discussion on how the screening could be done and also the diagnosis of exclusion because we want to make sure that other potential causes of the signs and symptoms similar to COVID are also analyzed and then uh, removed, right, or treated if they're present. But so that's so screening. We would even put uh, encourage a um, camps or slums areas to set up screening posts at the entrance of the community and even at the entrance of important sites where people would need to still go to even uh, in the strictest confinements, such as for example the marketplaces, right? So that's screening and testing. So testing PCR is needed to guide our clinical management. Serology is only afterward to see whether somebody has been exposed to the virus or not. It cannot be used to guide how a patient is going to be treated. Now, if you don't have PCR testing, then go for screening of signs and symptoms and detect your COVID cases based on signs and symptoms, even without any laboratory test. And so, now on uh, on the isolation uh, facilities, I'm sorry, but I forgot the question. Could you kindly repeat it? Thank you. So, uh, on the isolation facilities, uh, even if we're assuming that adequate isolation is possible, uh, sorry, are we assuming that uh, adequate isolation is possible in camps and camp-like setting? And uh, and maybe I use this opportunity, Teresa, to return back to uh, to Daniela, and uh, uh, and then we can we can tackle uh, this issue. Uh, should uh, Daniela haven't really captured it in her presentation? So thanks a lot, Teresa and Daniela. Back to you. Okay, um, so welcome again, everyone. Um, thank you for the slides, uh, and thank you very much for these two presentations. They pretty much encompass a lot of uh, what's happening, and um, the CCM, the Global CCM Cluster, has been very much working on, especially focusing on this particular, uh, on this particular setup, meaning isolation and quarantine facilities, because they require some sort of management, or they are set up in camp. So. There's a very direct link. So even if you might have settlements and sites, which under normal circumstances could be run smoothly, when it comes to setting up these kind of facilities and programs, it gets much more complicated. Now, uh, there are also a few things I wanted to mention before going into, into camp management or management of uh, sites, collective sites at this moment, and then specifically when it comes to isolation and uh, quarantine facilities and then address uh, briefly also the shielding concept, um, there are a few parameters that need to be considered. One is the formality of the sites, because many of the, of the things we've been hearing and many of the various uh, measures which are being taken are easier uh, implemented in more formal sites. So if you have um, uh, formal camps, if you have large sites where you can, where you do have structures, where you have some sort of organization, etc. Uh, many of the public health measures and the measures taken to prevent and to fight uh, COVID-19 uh, spread uh, can be 
um, can be added to already existing measures and can be kind of easier implemented. But you have many, uh, many contexts where you would have hundreds of informal sites and settlements where there are a few dozen of people uh, living in very precarious conditions. They might also have difficulties with uh, their uh, land and property and kind of facing evictions, etc., being in very regular situations. So how do you then do some of these measures? How do you, for example, isolate? How do you quarantine in, in such locations? So that's one thing which also the CCCM is looking at. Another part is the stage at which we are, because, for example, in Europe or in, 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 in several countries in the world, by now the, uh, the, the, um, the virus uh, spreading has been quite advanced. In Europe, the, the discussions right now are about uh, already starting deconfinement, etc., uh, which also means that in many countries where we have a large uh, proportion of displaced populations, uh, the virus is only arriving or it's only starting to be increasing. And so we had a window of opportunity over the past month or two to be able to prepare for it. Hence, a lot of, uh, uh, a, a lot of the activities in, uh, in the various uh, collective sites we're focusing on the preparedness, on what can we do in order to actually prevent or limit to the extent possible the propagation of the of the COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. So what is the role of camp management and how does it link to COVID-19? Uh, well, first of all, um, there is the, the, one of the major advantages of having a well, uh, an existing camp management or uh, a site management um, agency or um, or a service in any given site is the fact that there is already a lot of data which is available for the site, uh, which means you would have data on population profiles, which would include possibly their mob mobilities. You would have data on the, uh, the, the demographic profile of the population, on the vulnerabilities, etc., which is already uh, for preparation purposes, allow you to look at which are the populations or which are even the individuals who might be more at risk, where, who, where the attention should be more focused. The other aspect is that uh, the vast majority of, uh, especially formal sites, but also informal sites, do have some uh, sort of site monitoring, which includes uh, having systems for monitoring of various services. So again, there would be a wealth of data pre-existing the COVID-19, which allow for um, assessing how well are the services uh, uh, available. Uh, and I'm specifically then talking about health services, wash services, so having a, and having regular updates and regular trends. So uh, when it comes to preparedness space, uh, from in a number of countries, these data have been used to, um, to prepare to actually single out and to uh, to prioritize specific collective sites which might be more at risk and where more attention should be should be should be paid. Additionally, uh, the community engage community engagement, the communication and mobilization, uh, that has been a large part of uh, what the camp management agencies have been and are doing. And it's very important when it comes to implementing public health measures such as quarantine and isolation because the population needs to know what's happening. Uh, they also uh, need, they need to know what's happening. They need to know what is expected, what they are to be expected. They need to know where is it going? What are the timelines? Uh, in many places, uh, additional uh, volunteers are being used to, um, uh, to actually help with communication and to help with uh, public messaging. The other role, the referral pathways and national protocols. Again, the camp management is usually ensuring that uh, referrals within a camp or within a site function. But in addition, when it comes to COVID, there is the national protocols which might come into play. And so in several countries, uh, the national authorities have introduced measures uh, which might not have been there otherwise. And uh, it was important to ensure that these measures would be uh, compatible and would be kind of uh, introduced without uh, adverse uh, consequences to the population of the sites. Site improvement and maintenance. Brad has been talking about setting up of isolation and uh, isolation uh, centers and quarantine facilities. Um, but this is also something 
uh, site improvement and maintenance of the existing structures is important to be able to use them if necessary. Use of infrastructures and crown control, especially when it comes to trying to, uh, for example, um, flows in camps and sites to make sure that people are moving in one direction and not another one. And then it's also extremely important when it comes to uh, the shielding con con concept, which I will come, in, come to in a second. Uh, another part is coordination of services. Now that mo uh, that's a normal uh, part of work of camp management, but when we are talking about setting up particular facilities in camps uh, and uh, or in sites, isolation, quarantine facilities, and then let alone uh, the possibility of green zones, keep even discussing that, uh, they need to be serviced. They, the, the population who is in these facilities need to have access to all the possible services that they require to stay there. They, uh, and, and their stay must be also sustainable. So that was the, one, of the, one of the goals uh, for uh, camp man management agencies. And then obviously the camp management business continuity. Uh, Travel restrictions and movement restrictions are nowadays a reality. And uh, it's getting, it will probably be even getting worse. Uh, there might be uh, the need to actually not to, to completely isolate or to completely uh, uh, stop movement into camps. And that's already a reality in, a, in, a, in many operations. And so how do you ensure that activities will continue? And in particular, uh, how do you ensure that you can cater for the needs of isolation centers and uh, quarantine facilities set up in camps if the movement of humanitarian uh, staff and possibly even of nationals, uh, including health uh, staff, is uh, severely restricted? Next slide, please. So now the different settings and their relevance. The, uh, the quarantine, uh, as Teresa explained, it's something which is being, uh, it, it's not for confirmed cases, it's for cases who have some suspicion of exposure, who might be coming from places where uh, there has been a known uh, transmission of the virus. Um, and in the context of camps and camp-like settings, uh, this is very much true for either new arrivals or returns. Uh, so uh, in a number of locations, in order, for the new, in order not to prevent new arrivals entering camps and uh, entering camps, Quarantine uh, has been uh, introduced in order for them to be able to, uh, to enter to the camp, but then having separate zones where they, uh, where they would be able to spend those 14 days compulsory to, um, uh, to, uh, to see whether they would develop the symptoms or not, and then they can join the rest of the population in the camps. So quarantine part is, and it also will be valid for contacts or, or possible contacts of uh, suspicious uh, cases and um, in camps and camp-like settings, it would mostly, at least, uh, and colleagues who are online would know much more about this, uh, but there are, uh, in some places, quarantine is recommended, in some places it's made uh, compulsory, including through the introduction of fines or kind of being implemented through um, law enforcement uh, measures. Then there is the question of isolation. Uh, which is isolation for suspicious and or confirmed cases, mostly mild and moderate. And, and as Teresa explained, ideally they would be in, uh, in a dedicated facility and then in, in low, low research settings, in camps, camp-like settings, it would then, then uh, if that's not feasible, they would need to be um, uh, isolated within the, within the camp. And if even that's not possible, then the last option is actually make, taking some measures for home uh, isolation. Uh, and so for, from a camp management perspective, um, often uh, when isolation is possible in national hospitals or government facilities, these uh, facilities will be most, mostly outside of the, uh, of the camp or the, or the site, so that would be easier, that would be more the transfer of the people into these uh, facilities, but for camp management that wouldn't necessarily directly impact uh, other than making, uh, keeping the link between those who are going to, the, to these facilities and family members who might be staying in the camp, uh, making sure that care arrangements are done for people who might need such uh, children, as we'll be probably hearing later on, etc. Isolation facilities are also being set up in camps, and there it's either existing, uh, and there might have ex existing isolation facilities, especially, for example, in countries such as DRC, 
where previous Ebola, outbreak, uh, Ebola outbreak might have led to actually establishment of such, uh, such facilities, a building of new ones, and Brad has been talking about what kind of uh, facilities would be, uh, could be uh, set up, and then repurposing of existing facilities. Now, the, the, the slight uh, advantage is that uh, because of the, of the preventative measures for COVID spreading, many of the common, the common facilities in camps have been closed uh, because of the mass gatherings kind of restrictions. So they can be repurposed or be, to be used as isolation facilities. Uh, but there is still a need to be assessing whether that such repurposing is really meeting the, the, the purpose of isolating and it doesn't do some other harm for not having that kind of a facility used for their original purpose. And then, uh, especially when it's about uh, collective centers, for example, we have uh, situations where whole collective centers were closed, for example, reception facilities, because um, uh, some cases have been identified or have been suspected, and the authorities have closed the whole uh, reception facility to be now used as an isolation place or kind of quarantine, but then trans uh, transformed into an isolation place with all uh, people who are uh, with all the residents inside. From a camp management perspective, especially isolation facilities, they do remain a specialized facility for medical treatment. And so when it comes to managing them, it would be done by the health authorities, by the, by the health partners, with possible technical support from, uh, from uh, camp management agencies and actors, but not necessarily directly managed by uh, CCC and actors. But there is still, there still remain the issue of uh, service provision, and taking care of the family members who remain outside of those isolation uh, facilities. And finally, the last uh, point on the shielding, uh, which, and, and, and I know that it very often it's being used as one of the measures. Uh, now, it's not really one of the measures. Currently in isolation, that's something that is being uh, implemented in any case. It's a public health measure and it's being implemented Four cases who are confirmed or who are uh, at suspicion of being of, of having COVID nineteen. When it comes to shielding, it's the other way around. It, as in some operations, I've heard the the uh, uh, expression "reverse shielding," uh, uh, pardon, reverse isolation, which means how do I protect those who don't have the virus yet to make sure that they don't get it or that they are less likely to um, to contract the virus. And in that sense. And as, as uh, Teresa was mentioning, uh, it's a very controversial uh, concept. It would be very, very difficult to implement even under ideal circumstances. There are some operations in some countries where they are trying a few pilots uh, or they have five pilots. One which is currently ongoing is in Yemen. But as Teresa uh, uh, explained, uh, the, the shielding part is very much focusing on household level or extended family or extended household. Anything larger than that, the risks might very much outweigh the uh, the advantages. And especially in, in, in humanitarian settings, in camps and camp like settings, uh, the, uh, we can to connect, uh, which was not right? successful all along. I will wait. Uh, Johanna Ali, uh, can you please mute? Johanna, thanks. Please Sorry. proceed, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, so when it comes to shielding, uh, there are many, many challenges to it, which includes the fact that uh, as uh, already physical delimitation of the place, sustainability of it, maintaining uh, such a setting for longer term. At a, at a family level, that's what all our families are doing in any case. I mean, I think every family who has some high risk individuals are trying to shield them one way or another so that they would have limited contact with the outside world. But anything which goes beyond uh, the, the, the household or the kind of extended family uh, size would be very, very complicated. Uh, and from a management perspective, from the, from the, uh, from the no contact perspective, um, it probably brings more risks than it would do good, except it's a consideration considering that you might have a choice, we do that or we do nothing, and we know that the health services uh, are not sufficient. Next slide, please. In our last slide, the challenges. 
So there are a few challenges uh, for uh, any of, I mean, for, for all the public health measures to be implemented in camps and camp like settings. One of them is out of where you need to be making um, choices between is this measure sufficiently uh, important that I invest into this one with my limited resources, or should I be trying to do something else which might actually better address or have a, have a, have a more of a um, of an impact? Now, I'm not talking about the, the, the very basic public health measures which are compulsory, but anything else. I mean, from a, from a management perspective, you are trying to really focus on those that you know will have the highest uh, success rate to it. The unknown exposures, that's another difficulty in many of the contexts where uh, you would not really know who might have the virus already and who might not. So you need to behave as if everyone would have it, but then that makes it so much more complicated uh, to, be con to continue to operate in times. Uh, further is the maintenance of services. And that means that, that means both if we do for isolation facilities or uh, quarantine facilities, how do you maintain provision of services, respecting all the, uh, all the public health measures to, um, uh, to ensure that there is no transmission of virus. Um, how do you ensure services are maintained if there is limited uh, or restricted access to the camps? How do you ensure that all the various initiatives which are happening at a camp level are well coordinated? Uh, there are many of the initiatives, um, there are many of the interventions which require certain sectors uh, or certain clusters. Uh, but sometimes it's complicated to make sure that everyone who needs to be around the table is present and uh, and can actually uh, coordinate those interventions. And it's the only way how all these measures can actually make sense, led by the health authorities and led by the health um, health uh, colleagues. Community engagement. Many of the measures being taken need to be up. I mean, all of the measures which are being taken need absolutely to have. The consent of the community and community has to be fully on board. Uh, they need to understand why things are happening, they need to understand what are the consequences, they need to understand how long it will take, uh, and they need to also be able to express what, what they could do. They need to be part of the of, of, of those solutions um, uh, because that's the only way how they would have a buy-in. And how many of the measures, for example, quarantine, uh, even isolation, would be uh, would be respected. Remote management and monitoring, which is another uh, challenge when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, restriction of movement, and how do you make sure that all the services, including them, uh, running of the isolation facilities and quarantine and monitoring what's happening in the facilities, can be done with uh, the restriction on on actually presence of maintenance workers, and finally sustainability. Uh, quarantine and isolation is usually 14 days. Aman, uh, can you also kindly mute? Uh, thank you very much. Please proceed. Uh, Thanks. Um, so that's 14 days. If you would be considering, or even at the smallest scale, shielding, that might take much, much longer. Um, because that should remain as long as the virus is present in the environment or in the community. And uh, so how, do you, how, how long can you maintain what you need to maintain without compromising all the other services, without compromising all the other activities that are going to be happening at the, at the, at the camp uh, or at the camp level? This would be the main uh, point from a, from a camp management perspective. And finally, uh, Daniela, uh, maybe I ask Diana Hisok uh, to mute. Diana, can you please mute? Thanks a lot. Uh, go ahead, Daniela. Yes. No, this was just uh, that this would be a kind of a very brief overview of the various considerations for camp management. And I know and I've seen that there are many, many colleagues online who are actually implementing these measures, who are working in camp management and uh, in situations where there are including uh, looking at shielding, but also in particular looking at how to how to deal with isolation facilities, how to deal with quarantine on uh, entrance uh, on upon entry to the camps. So I think it'd be great to hear from them. Thank you very much. So much, uh, Daniela. It's uh, it's quite a job.
uh, I think uh, uh, dealing with uh, with the situation uh, in uh, in camps and uh, and settlement settings. Uh, before I turn back to the questions, I would like to call on a, a colleague from uh, Libya, Anne Marie. Uh, do you want to uh, brief us quickly on how is the context in in, in your operation? Uh, and what kind of solutions are you are you seeking to have? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay, William? Loud and clear. Please proceed on that. Great. So just a, a brief update on how we're sort of thinking about isolation and, and quarantine in Libya. Uh, right now, the Ministry of Health has not actually established full-on quarantine or isolation sites. They've identified a few for medical isolation, but as for quarantine uh, facilities, those are being done at home. Uh, we're, we're having part, uh, partners doing protection monitoring in the communities that we know have uh, been impacted by COVID. Uh, how we're looking at going forward, though, is we've been working in close collaboration with the Global Protection Cluster on creating tools for monitoring sites, particularly ones that we're looking at that are co-located with military uh, objectives. Uh, so this is the biggest constraint in our um, mind is that a lot of the isolation sites that the ministry has identified are in fact co-located with military locations. Uh, so this is something that I would like to highlight potentially as a, a topic for conversation is how do we uh, ensure that protection principles and humanitarian principles are able to be upheld in these uh, sites. So I'm wondering if any of the speakers have insights on to that. Uh, but as for the rest of the monitoring that we're doing, I think it very much mirrors the work that is being done in other operations where we've established community networks to provide inputs and feedback on uh, information about COVID as it's spreading and also about uh, sort of the information that communities have about uh, what they need to do to isolate or quarantine themselves. Uh, so over from my side, thanks so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Anne-Marie. This is uh, uh, quite uh, handy and useful. So now I'd like to launch a bit of the challenge to the panelists. I will direct some questions we've received to you by, uh, by name. And I would like to challenge you to answer uh, every question uh, with one minute uh, answer so we can have a quick uh, fire round um, of, uh, of keeping uh, the questions coming uh, through the chat box and redirecting them uh, to you. So I would like to uh, go back full circle to, uh, to you, Teresa. Uh, there is a question coming from Michelle. Uh, to you, uh, that she's seen estimation from one organization that if we consider underlying health issues, the percentage of the population that might need shielding of some kind might be up to 80%. Uh, what would be your advice uh, on that approach uh, in that kind of setting? Uh, over to you, Teresa, one minute. Um, that, that's a very spot on question, and, I, and this is actually uh, what we need to. Uh, bear in mind may happen because we don't understand fully yet what are the other risk factors for complications and poor outcomes in humanitarian settings. So yes, I mean, you're, you're making that assumption rightly. If um, other risk factors exist and it would increase the number of, of the proportion of the population requiring shielding, uh, this is also even more reason why all the public health and social measures really need to be implemented for everyone uh, because we never know who else might be vulnerable are we targeting the right group or are we missing others who may even be more vulnerable to complications and poor outcomes? And that is why we're not so supportive of collective accommodations uh, for those who are seen as individuals at high risk for complications. Over. Thanks a lot, uh, Teresa. Uh, I would like to turn to Sofia Khetebidundi. Uh, uh, is there any specific, uh, that's a question, is there any specific dimensions that we have to look on specifically for children uh, the context of our discussion. Sophia, can you hear me? Yes, thanks a lot, William. Yeah, a couple of considerations that, uh, that needs to be taken into account when uh, looking at child protection in isolation and quarantine centers. Um, first of all, I think it is very important that there are clear policies or, or rules that ensures that uh, home-based isolation 
um, is guaranteed so that uh, children are uh, isolated at home with their primary caregiver and if they have to be in quarantine centers that they are also uh, there together with their uh, caregivers. Um, the second uh, key uh, recommendation is that child safeguarding measures are in place in these isolation and quarantine facilities. By that we mean uh, that health workers who are uh, running the centers needs to have basic training on, on child protection and need to be able to refer cases to a protection practitioner uh, if uh, need be. Uh, we also mean that uh, mental health and psychosocial support uh, should be available, uh, that the minimum recreational facilities and activities need to be also available. And also very importantly, that the design of these centers are such that they can mitigate the risk of GBV and, and sexual uh, um, abuse, for example, by you know separating, making sure that children are separated from adults, uh, that there's uh, lights and, and uh, separated uh, uh, wash facilities. In addition, when we uh, encounter uh, unaccompanied children, uh, either because uh, they were separated because of displacement or if their caregiver is uh, also uh, isolated in another center, um, we need to have a basic tracing, uh, family tracing uh, capacity to try to identify either uh, a kinship who can uh, take care of uh, the child or prepare for alternative care solutions once the, the unaccompanied child is uh, released from um, the isolation or, or um, uh, quarantine center. Uh, finally, um, it's also important to ensure that uh, there is a very good coordination between health and uh, protection sector or cluster, uh, that there are clear SOPs uh, put in place for the registration and sharing of, of data uh, pertaining to the ch children and, and, and the family. Um, and it's really, again, very important that uh, health staff, uh, that there is a, at least a health uh, focal point uh, that is kind of a referral in the center for child protection and who can uh, kind of provide basic uh, support to children, but also ensure a referral to uh, child protection uh, services and actors uh, if needed. So I think these are the key considerations that, uh, that needs to be uh, looked at when, uh, when dealing with uh, um, uh, isolation or quarantine center. Thanks, William. Thanks a lot, uh, Sophia. That's, uh, that's important uh, dimension to keep in mind. Brett, uh, we have a question from Jenny Lam uh, saying that uh, she has many teams uh, in the Asia region asking for support on how to adapt the future evacuation centers to be adapted to, to the pandemic. This is uh, in response to, uh, to, to the season that is upcoming in terms of uh, cyclone and monsoons. Uh, are there any discussions, tips, guidance, practical ideas uh, on uh, how to deal with that. Brett, over to you one minute. Thanks, William. Um, thanks to, I think it was Jamila that answered the question. So it's around adaptation of evacuation facilities, yeah? So I think, I mean, we, we still don't know a huge amount of details around the um, architectural and the epidemiological relationship. You know, in many other contexts where you have um, building designers and planners working to um, reach health outcomes, it's based on a lot of science. And I'm thinking to kind of a past life when I had to do quite a few TB clinics for the Global Fund. And there's really been a decade of research there around the uh, role of adequate ventilation, for example, in treating TB cases. Um, and reducing transmission. Now, we don't know if that is also reasonably similar for COVID-19 or not, but at least some of the information that, are, that we've been reading um, and that the, are the general principles of se severe acute respiratory um, infection is that adequate ventilation is really important. So spacing of patients, adequate ventilation, and also categorization. Now, of course, these are not always easy to achieve when we have to um, repurpose an existing building for a new function. It's always easier the other way around. 
where you see what the human need is and then you design a facility for that. But repurposing, of course, other way around is a bit complicated. Now, back to the um, understanding of who are you creating or modifying the facility for? Is it for known cases? Is it for isolation? Is it for suspected? So if you know who the facility will be used for and what the calculation is from the health colleagues, from the health authorities of how many beds to cater for, that's the first step. Um, now, looking at the SARI guidance from WHO and um, uh, guidance for management um, of acute respiratory cases and the infrastructure selection, we have some clear understanding of how to lay out a facility and the spacing between beds. So you can easily look at the square meter surface area of your existing building and roughly calculate um, how many patients could be accommodated in that. But bearing in mind, as I said, knowing the caseload, is it for confirmed, is it for suspect, um, and is it for those requiring higher care versus just basic care? So your health authorities and health colleagues will help determine the caseload, and then the shelter colleague can help determine um, the surface area of the existing facility and what modification might be required. Ventilation, as I mentioned, is very important, especially in um, low resource contexts where we don't have possibilities for negative pressure rooms or mechanical ventilation. So adequate natural ventilation that is big windows, shaded verandas, very, very important. They're just a couple of rules of thumb. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Brett. That's uh, uh, that's uh, very uh, precise and uh, accurate. Uh, help page, Alicia, Robert, you raise an important point in the chat box. If you can hear me, it would be great if you can make uh, a quick intervention uh, on the issue. Alicia? Um, yeah, I hear you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Please proceed. Um, perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, just really, I, I think it's pretty straightforward what I've put there in the box, but we, we were asked to review from HelpAge um, some standing operating procedures that were being put together in Lebanon. It was taking into account those that have caregivers, which were children, unaccompanied children, but also older people and people with disabilities. And so we would say that it's really important to understand that um, the situation of, of caregiving might also apply to older people and people with disabilities. And we need to be really conscious of the fact that um, it's important where at all possible to keep um, people with caregivers um, to not separate them unnecessarily in instances of quarantine or isolation. Um, and so we would be happy, I think, um, to share those guidelines. Um, we've asked for a final copy to come back to us after the review. Um, so we'd be happy to, once we get our hands on those, to share them back to you so they could be circulated more widely, if that would be helpful. Thanks a lot. That would be very helpful, and then we will make sure also to circulate it on our uh, different websites uh, for the tools shared. Uh, Teresa, I want to get back to you uh, on a, a, a topic uh, that hasn't been touched upon uh, a lot, coming from Depix uh, Shershan. Uh, he's asking, uh, how are safe and dignified burials planned and handled? Uh, are there, do we have clarity of roles and responsibilities, especially in those situations uh, where there is limited or no access to additional land? Uh, has this issue uh, come up with you? I know that the ICRC has just been uh, launching a, a campaign uh, on the issue and issued some guidance, but uh, over to you, uh, uh, please, uh, Teresa. Thank you very much. So um, I was actually looking at the technical guidance uh, page of WHO. So there's actually a technical guidance under infection prevention and control on burials. So it is important to remember that this is a respiratory disease as far as, as we know it at the moment. Uh, and so we're not talking about burials for Ebola cases, for example, which is different. Now, uh, the biggest issue with burials of COVID-19 cases is actually in the gathering. Um, 
Because, uh, because as we know, uh, keeping safe distance, uh, avoiding uh, unessential movement is, is of extreme importance. So th that's the, so there's a lot of discussions and planning that needs to be done with um, people in charge, community leaders and whoever, to actually make sure uh, that ways could be put in place for uh, this public health and social measure. I, I can't really give uh, specific details. I mean, some I think have mentioned even um, a, a recorded or you know uh, or a broadcast of a funeral that could be watched uh, from different locations, and therefore then physical distancing could be ensured. So it's mostly in the ceremony ceremonial part that that would become a problem. No, on the land for burials, I don't think I'm I'm the right person to say anything about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I could try to. It, it's not really an area of strength of WHO to to be able to answer to that. Uh, so, so perhaps other colleagues could um, uh, chip in on on the land for burials. Uh, what I can do is also send you uh, the link to uh, the burial uh, guidance um, uh, right after. This. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that's uh, clear. Colleagues were uh, reaching almost the end of the time. I want to extend for five more minutes uh, to uh, to cover a couple of more questions. I I hope you can stay with us, Daniela. Uh, whilst the principle of separation of all mild and moderate cases in designated facilities is clear, as asked by Scales. Uh, in camp settings, has this been achieved and maintained in any operations uh, where we can learn from, uh, to your knowledge? Is this question uh, related to if you don't have a possibility of actually, uh, I mean, there are two things. One is whether the, those moderate and mild cases, you, you can send them to a separate facility within the camp or, or, or outside, depending also on, on the context. Another thing is indeed, if you cannot have them in a separate context, then you need to actually do home isolation and home might mean a few uh, pieces of plastic sheeting. And so in that case, one of the possibilities uh, is to repurpose certain areas of the camp or of the site where uh, that requires a bit more kind of thinking and a more uh, more uh, looking into what is feasible. But that is one of the options where instead of therefore everyone being and isolating at home, if that's really the only option that is available in the camp, there would be kind of, uh, uh, if you wish, isolation zones created. It's not ideal, but it might be the only option you would have where you would then be able to have some sort of um, some sort of more uh, kind of uh, a buffer between the population who is not infected and those who are sick, except you would also need, and this would be led by health, obviously, where you would also then need to make sure that all the health uh, measures that need to be put in place would be available to people, uh, to, to those who are sick and uh, who are isolating in that zone. In addition to provision of services, uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, family relations, ability of their family relatives to be visiting or at least to be able to maintain contact with those uh, family members who are being in, 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 in isolation. I don't know if that brings answers the question. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think that's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, spot on. Uh, Brett, I have a, a follow-up question from Yasin in, in Syria. So in relation to the rehabilitation of provocations uh, for current use, uh, this seems uh, like an issue uh, observed in many operations. Is there a one approach? Uh, uh, for example, government public buildings are used for quarantine facilities, or if they're not there, there is a kind of checklist of issues and standards that have to be met. Uh, is there, does the IASC uh, guidance cover this? Do you have uh, uh, in your guidance uh, any uh, directives for this that can be shared over to you, Matt? Thank you, William. And I just see a little bit more additional information on this issue in the chat box there from Jane. And this is consistent with, with our guidance as well, that 
um, and it's across the sphere standards too, that we should avoid using schools um, for isolation or screening or uh, treatment facilities of, of any sort, um, unless it's a last resort, okay? And that would need to be done in consultation with um, the education authorities and, and cluster and so forth. In terms of the public buildings, I mean, public buildings can be many, many things. They could be, they could have been repurposed storage buildings. Uh, they may be government buildings or not government buildings. If they're existing owned government buildings, certainly the government um, will be the authority to say what can and can't be used. I think when they're within camps and you do have, you know, situations where if you have, for example, a reception centre or a transit centre that has been depopulated and has been sterilised according to say methods prescribed by the CDC with um, a bleach solution. You can also use commercially available cleaners, but they do have different effects on plastic surfaces. Now that's all available on the CDC website where you see two kinds of uh, information. One is for disinfection of public buildings and the other is for disinfection of domestic buildings. And the guidance is very straightforward, how to prepare um, a cheap, locally available um, option for bleach solution. Of course, disinfecting, disinfecting is not the same as cleaning. Cleaning, you have to do regularly. Disinfecting is required every time there's a change of patient. So I'm saying this in relation to once a building is identified, what kind of preparation would be needed? And I answered that kind of in the previous question. Um, but then the, the importance of regular cleaning and disinfection as well, especially between patients. Separation of categories is possible and the SARI guidelines um, give you some methods to achieve that. It can be as basic as plastic sheeting, but of course the more rigid you make the separation, that is a solid screen of some sort, that would help prevent aerosol contamination because the predictions that are going on now is that you need at least two meters between people but preferably more because when anybody coughs or sneezes uh, the aerosol circulates in the air and that's the other reason why we don't want to cross um, populate the um, uh, severely sick with the mild cases so the, the selection of the buildings is important. Now, if it's public, the government have to be involved. And as I mentioned, the basic repurposing is possible, but any other kind of building in the camp or on site can be used, especially for low risk um, and, sorry, um, you know, uh, uh, low category patients. Those that require greater care should be located um, within the, within or beside the health facility in extension. Other facilities can be used for low risk or for isolation. But as mentioned, you know, when you have isolation at home, at least there is family level care available. When there's isolation that's separated from the existing family dwelling, and there's a lot of issues that arise there as Daniela and the other colleagues have mentioned around um, protection and support and you know feeding of the elderly and feeding children so that then limits the effectiveness of the isolation in the first place okay uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, so much uh, I uh, have a, a final question to Daniela and then I will turn to all the panelists for a closing uh, remarks where I would like you to highlight where can uh, all the participants seek more information and how they can reach out to you or your teams at the end. But before the final round, uh, Daniela, the congestions of camps and settlements uh, have come up, a uh, couple of the presentations. Uh, any quick uh, direction? Uh, you can give our uh, participants on where to look for good examples and tip sheets uh, that uh, that they can uh, use, uh, be inspired by for their operations. Over to you, Daniela. Uh, 
Well, I've taken a little bit of back because if, if it comes to actually physically moving people within, that would be something which site planners would have to be very heavily involved. And so, uh, so I would say that both uh, the guidance could be found on the shelter cluster website, which has been provided, and also some then, uh, and then some implications and especially preparations for decongestion, especially when moving people requires a very strong uh, community engagement. And uh, so that because they might have their already existing land, they they or they might have their existing houses where they have lived for a very long time, decongestioning will be perturbed, uh, will be disrupting their daily life in addition to already the, the, the measures which are being taken for COVID prevention. So it's something which would definitely have to be very strongly consulted with the community and explained. And then looking also at whom would you want to be moving first, because in some, uh, in, in, in some um, contexts, it might be actually one of the ways how you would protect your most vulnerable would be, would be to taking them if you are having the possibility of decongestion, that you would actually moving first those who are at high risk and placing them into individual housing or placing them into into a more uh, into an area where more space is available. So you would actually be doing a measure which is feasible, but you would be prioritizing who should be moved from those areas which are most um, overcrowded. Over. Thanks a lot, uh, Daniela. Uh, so. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, in this order, Dan uh, Brett, then Daniela, then Teresa, I would like you to take the floor and hammer your message that no one should miss out on uh, and then offer of continued support in a, in a clear way. Where can you be contacted? Uh, so, Brett. Go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, William. I'll hammer home the point. Um, two key messages. One is at the household level and the settlement level. Uh, there's a key relationship between living conditions and transmission risk. So reduce density at the household level, reduce density at the settlement level if it is deemed as being too dense. This must be done not as a single gesture, but with the appropriate hygiene and health inputs as well, and the consultation which we've just discussed within this WebEx. All resources are available online and there's more coming. If you need to reach out, reach out to your cluster coordinator in your relevant country. If there's not a cluster coordinator there, reach us at the global level um, on our uh, general email list, or you can, directly contact myself, Brett Moore at UNHCR, or Alice Adaralu um, at IFRC. Okay, thanks very much. Excellent, Brett. Perfect example of hammering the point. Daniela, can you do the same? Yes. Uh, when it comes to camp management, the main consideration for uh, isolation and quarantine uh, centers and facilities would be to make sure that not only services and things are provided in this uh, in these facilities, but that the population and the residents and the family members who are staying in the camps, who are staying outside of these facilities, are being serviced in, with what they need as well. That they can be in touch with their family, uh, with their family members, and that uh, there is a real thinking around sustainability of any interventions and the co unintended consequences that some uh, health measures. Uh, might have on uh, on human rights and on the, on the daily life of the people. And when it comes to support, uh, CCCM cluster, UNHCR or IOM, or reach to us uh, through the global uh, website, which I posted those Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela. Uh, Teresa, the floor is yours. Thank you, William. Uh, so two key messages. The first one is, all prevention measures for COVID-19 is really based on the mode of transmission. And so all the public health principles behind these measures is based on how, again, one can contract uh, the disease. So it is extremely important that we remember these principles because then we uh, are more free to contextualize or to adapt the measures according to resources available and according to the context. Uh, but then, uh, so it is not important to actually follow by the letter uh, everything that is written in the technical guidance that may not be applicable, but re please remember the public health principles behind it and then work around the context according to this principle. Secondly, if we really want to 
contain this outbreak, then we need to detect, isolate, and treat cases. And we need to put in all efforts to do it. I mean, in the context of the Ebola outbreak, we were eventually able to mobilize enough resources to, uh, to, to, to establish enough treatment centers, to establish enough tr uh, testing capacity. So there, there is a lot that can be done uh, if we really want to do it. And, and um, shielding, for example, may be an alternative that looks much more feasible uh, for, with low resources, but then it won't solve the problem of containing uh, the outbreak. So please remember what the most important interventions are to really bring this outbreak to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Colleagues, uh, thank you so much for a very lively discussion. A lot of questions uh, that have been answered. Uh, a lot of questions that are yet uh, to be answered as we're navigating this uh, uh, this challenge in the in the coming weeks. I would like to uh, thank our three panelists. Uh, I would uh, also like to uh, to thank our colleague from Libya and uh, Sofia uh, from uh, from the Global Protection Cluster team representing also the Child Protection AOR in uh, in this context uh, for the intervention. Uh, this is an important issue for us uh, from the protection sector. My uh, one uh, conclusion uh, from this meeting is for all uh, protection coordinators, uh, the protection implications of uh, any of these measures seems very significant. Uh, however, we can't make any uh, moves uh, regarding any of these measures we, without full support and backing for the uh, health actors, for the camp uh, and settlement managers, and the shelter people. This is uh, a challenge that requires a lot of discussions and agreement in the field, uh, and hence a lot of uh, patience and, uh, and, uh, and willingness uh, to reach an agreement and consistency in messaging uh, with government counterparts and partners. So. Uh, with this, I would like to, uh, to, to close this first episode of this discussion. Uh, I promise to have a follow-up uh, based on the questions that you have asked to dive more in some of them uh, in following webinars. With this, uh, I wish you a very good uh, weekend uh, and uh, have uh, a, uh, some rest if you can uh, and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you, William. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.